This is High Park. It is sometimes referred to as the jewel in the crown of the Toronto Park System. It is about 400 acres in the middle of the western end of Toronto. It's been a park for about 200 years. It's been used for both natural area management and for a whole range of other activities, even right from the very beginning. It was given to the city by John Howard in the 1860s and has been used for all kinds of different things through that whole period. The problem with it is that it is an urban park and because of that there are all kinds of pressures and assaults on the park from rows and rows of increasing condominiums in this area. The City of Toronto has decided that this is to be a new growth area to invasive species that are brought in from people's lawns and just across the province of Ontario. There is increasing dog use throughout the park and issues involving water, pollution, and a range of other environmental issues. So in this series, I'm going to be looking at each of these individual issues to give you some insight into the assaults on the park and the issues that the park and parks management has to handle. Hi, Mr. Mayor. John. And your affiliation? Uh, Programs Director at the High Park Nature Center. And what does that mean that you have to do? I oversee uh, the programs uh, that we offer. We offer <coughs> programs for kids uh, which is basically six months, up to 16 years old, and then also adult programs, and uh, we're starting to do more senior programs as well. Our, our mission is to connect people and the ecosystem through stewardship and outdoor education. This is uh, Grenadier Lodge. This is a map of High Park. High Park is 400 acres. It starts up at Bloor Street, way up here, Parkside Drive, then down to the Queensway and is bordered on the edge by a uh, built-up uh, area. As you can see from the map, there are all kinds of things, activities in the park, chewing up the natural areas. The natural areas are in the west and in the east, but most of the rest of it is softball diamonds, uh, swimming pools, there's a dog off-leash area, allotment gardens and so on that people use in the park. One of the great problems in Hyde Park is invasive species. They come from uh, gardens and other parts of the city. Some people actually come and deliberately plant uh, things in the park for their own purposes. But mostly it's coming from the natural areas and these are uh, species that are coming from all over the world. The thing about invasive species is because they have no natural enemies in the local area, they can proliferate. Here we have the famous dog strangling vine. Uh, there's oriental bittersweet and other um, invasive species. To get rid of it, you got to pull it out, but I got some of the root. But with most invasive species like dog strangling vine, you actually have to get some chemicals in, which is another whole issue, environmental issue. On the other side of the road, there is goldenrod, which has become mostly naturalized in the city. There is jewelweed and a whole range of other species that have come into the park and that are slowly but surely either strangling or becoming naturalized and it's just part of the dynamic ecology of a park like High Park. It requires an immense amount of work by the High Park staff to try and keep these things under at least some marginal control. I used to vilify the plant itself, but it's just doing what it does really, really well. Uh, we do a lot of re invasive species removal with uh, the teens and the high school students. And uh, there's just tons in Hyde Park, and they're moving. I've seen lists, um, botanical inventories going back to the 1800s. And uh, Steve Varga is a biologist, a botanist at the Ministry of Natural Resources, and he's done an, a more recent inventory. And you can see uh, the difference of the plants that were here and are no longer exist. And there's so many on that list that are either rare or non-existent in High Park anymore. And I think these are native species. Mostly. Native species mostly, and there's just so many of them that are gone. We don't see them. We never saw them. I never saw them. So they're out of our, our imagination. So we don't really think of them. And a lot of the reason I think is because of some of the invasive species. Um, this dog is drinking polluted water and people should not actually have their dogs uh, drinking this water because it has all kinds of chemicals in it. There are areas of the park that, have been, that are fenced and there are other areas of the park 
are called off-leash areas where the dogs can roam free. This is the entrance to the off-leash area for the dog park. But the off-leash area is a specific area that was uh, instituted by the park some time ago. And it is the place where people gather with their dogs throughout the park. So it was supposed to be a solution to the dog population in the park and all it's done is make the park even more dog friendly and dog useful. I speak as a dog owner. Dogs on leash and, and dogs that are under voice command, I mean, they really have a very small impact. Um, but when we see so many dogs that are in the natural areas, uh, it's a problem. There's trampling, there's uh, stress on wildlife. I've seen so many dogs chasing animals, um, causing stress that way. Uh, there's also digging of holes. If, uh, it seems like if a dog can smell a chipmunk underground or something, it'll start digging a hole so you'll see these trails and then along the side, you'll see a dog that digs a hole, sometimes three feet deep, down into the side of that trail and then all of a sudden you have all that erosion. If that's on a little hillside, then that starts to erode really quickly. This is Grenadier Restaurant, where we are now. This is the Hillside Gardens, which is a um, kind of ornamental area. Again, Grenadier Pond. This is Wendigo Creek that feeds into Grenadier Pond on the west side of the park. So the water, when it comes in, is not very clean. When it hits the marsh, the marsh acts as a filter. The water then moves its way down through Grenadier Pond. It's actually reasonably clean when it hits Grenadier Pond, which helps with the fish and the birds and so on and then finds its way into Lake Ontario. This is Grenadier Pond. It is about 15 hectares. It has a depth of about three meters. It's been central to the park ever since it was added to the park at the end of the 19th century. And in the wintertime, like now, people are starting to skate on it again the way they used to do it in the 1920s and 30s. In the last 20 or 30 years, it's been restored and reconditioned. Um, before that, there's uh, been all kinds of building here. Yep. Parts of it were actually grass and which have been torn out and have been replaced by wetland and by new habitat for the fish that now uh, increasingly re-inhabit the park. The park has been restocked with sunfish, perch, large mouth, mouth bass, and people have now gone back into doing fishing in the park. Uh, it is actually an interesting story about restoration and um, how a park, how a pond can come back after having been really desecrated for a very long period of time. Although High Park is 400 acres, only about 80 of the park's acres is actually natural areas. As you can see here, a whole pile of the park is made up of uh, lawned surfaces with hedges and with ornamental uh, gardens. And whole areas of the park have been ornamentalized, and they were ornamentalized starting in the 1950s as a way of getting people more interested uh, in the park as a place to come and visit. There was this idea that people just didn't want to go to a park just to look at the nature and the trees. Who would want to do that because it's so boring? Uh, so they had to put in all this ornamental guards and so on. High Park has got within it a whole series of historic styles of gardens. Ornamental gardens, gardens with big images around them that people can see from higher up and a Japanese garden. This is the Japanese garden, which is a very beautiful addition which was made during the 1950s and the 1960s. This is Grenadier Restaurant. It's been a mainstay of the park since the 1950s. It is dry. It is in the will of John Howard when he uh, passed on that there should be no alcohol in the park and the Grenadier Restaurant is one of the last places in the city where you cannot get a drink. Um, it is an example, however, also of the amount of space that's taken up by automobiles and by parking lots in the, in the park. During the 1950s, the city government in Toronto decided that people were not using the park enough. 
they decided that most people were just not interested in nature in the park as a park so they plateaued off this whole area and they started putting in baseball diamonds swimming pools hockey and a whole lot of the amenities that are now in the middle of the park people come from all over the city to have barbecues to have charity events and all on this plateaued area uh, we always throw down the number that, you know, a million users annually, um, but we've been saying that number for a long time and no one really knows exactly how many people use High Park and nobody knows how many people are using different trails in the natural areas and that'd be really, really uh, great knowledge to know uh, in terms of planning, city planning, also parks planning, trails planning, uh, stewardship work. Um, so yeah, it's, it, anecdotally, we've noticed that uh, use of the park has certainly increased. A lot of dogs that are off-leash and on-leash areas. Um, I see foraging all throughout the year. All of the, the natural impacts of those actions, so there's erosion. Um, we see a real spread of invasive species as well. The natural areas now are relegated to the west and the east slopes of the park and most of the park that most people think about is the area that which I'm standing on now. High Park can serve as a place where people can uh, learn more about urban nature and, and can learn to be stewards and to participate in stewardship in High Park. So uh, I think part of our role here at the Nature Centre is to change the lens through which people see the park and to see it through, to see it as a natural space as well as the amenities, the soccer fields, the cherry blossoms, the restaurants and all of those things. Those things exist and that's great and they bring people to the park. Um, but, but it's when we see people that are in natural areas without knowledge of, that it is a natural area or the value of it ecologically uh, that we see the biggest impacts. For people who love High Park and are concerned about its future, the hope is that people coming into the park for whatever purposes, to walk their dogs, to engage in sports, to walk through the natural areas, will look carefully, will see, and perhaps in their encounter with the park, they might think about how to recreate themselves and the park in forms of mutual flourishing.